Biblical marriage lesson two, submission and subjection. Within every marriage, there is both submission and subjection. We're going to define those in a moment, but you'll find both of those working hand in hand on many levels. Not just, it's not one way street. So the Bible clearly lays out the roles of the husband and the wife, which we'll be discussing in other lessons that we'll be getting to very soon. But we'll get to what the husband, what he's supposed to be doing, what the wife's supposed to do. But we can see that submission and subjection within the marriage are like a nicely paved street that runs in both directions toward each spouse at the proper time. So we're not, wait a minute, I thought the wife was just supposed to subject to the husband. He's supposed to be like a caveman, knock her over the head, tell her what to do, and drag her around by the hair. No, 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 that's not the way this works. It's not what the Bible establishes. That's just a man being lazy and wanting to domineer things and be a dictator. But what the Bible says is submission and subjection within the marriage will say that they are, according to the Bible, the way it lays it out, is like a nicely paved street that runs in both directions toward each spouse. So that means submission runs towards each other and subjection runs towards each other at the proper time. And, we're, and through this lesson, you'll see the proper times, that, what that really looks like. So definitions, submission is defined as yielding to governance or authority, subordinate to or subordinate to, Obeying the voluntary attitude of giving in and cooperating. So I'm going to say this again. Because submission should be working for each and every one of us, especially when it comes to God. And God paints throughout the entire Bible the, what the relationship with Him, and through, especially in the New Testament with Jesus Christ, how we work through Him toward God, that we're supposed to be submitted to God. So this is probably the most important one to each and every one of us. Because at the end of the day, whether we're talking about marriage or not, we, we should know how to submit to God, and that's submission. So it's defined as yielding to governance or authority, subordinate to, obeying. But here's the one that's the key factor, the voluntary, voluntary, <laughs> not coerced, not having your arm twist, not... You know, having a gun pointed to your head, the voluntary attitude of giving in, the voluntary attitude of saying, that's my authority and I'm submitting. I'm, putting, I'm voluntarily putting myself under that authority. The voluntary attitude of giving in and cooperating. Subjection is defined as to bring under control and also has the same definition of submission, but each word has different pictures within its usage. So we'll see that how they, they're tied together, but yet they're separate things. So submission is the line of authority that reflects one ranking above another. We would say that submission is more vertical. There's one ranking, outranking the other. And it's like in the military, you've got to learn this very quick. You've got to learn who outranks who and how to get in line. But then subjection is the line of authority that displays presenting information for consideration or input before making a decision. That means that when you subject, you bring to equal, we would say the subjection is more horizontal. You bring up to level, but then at the proper time, once that consideration, once that advice is given, counsel, however you want to put that, then subjection turns back into submission. And we'll see what that looks like here in a few moments. Subjection is the line of authority that displays presenting information for consideration or input before making a decision. Every person is under submission to God because there is, no, there is none like Him. Every person. No matter, no matter your sex. There's only two sexes, male or female. <laughs> no matter which one you are, we all must submit to God. While in marriage, each situation should reflect whether the spouse is submitted or subjected to the other spouse. So the wife submits to the husband. So Ephesians 5, 23-24 says, Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands. Notice the word submit. It doesn't say subject yourself. It says submit your, yourselves to your own husbands. Notice how we have underlined own husband. Because sometimes it's easier for you know, a wife to submit to somebody else's husband, or we would say other leader, you know, whether it's in church, whether it's on the job, whatever the case may be. And that may be somebody else's husband, but they have a hard time submitting to their own. And that's not biblically accurate. We, you know, for ladies and wives, must submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. When you're submitting yourself to your own husband, you're not just submitting to him as, 
you're the head of your household, you're submitting him because Christ tells us to, because the word tells us to, but it also says as unto the Lord. Because if the Lord establishes, if God establishes this submission rank and file, then that means we must fall in line with what the Bible says. Now, we will see other verses because this can start out sounding sexist, but it's not. It's what the Bible says, and we'll see the responsibility of the husband as well to subject himself to his wife and at times submit to her. And we'll get to that in a few moments, but I just want to throw that out there because sometimes if you don't have a precursor or kind of put that foreshadowing in there, people get offended, they turn, they turn you off or they shut you off and say, well, he's sexist or he's this or he's that. We're just talking about the Bible. Amen. Wives, submit yourselves to your own husbands as unto the Lord, for the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Notice twice Paul puts this, your own husbands, your own husbands. Ephesians 5.33, we'll say B, says, And the wife see that she reverence her husband, her husband. Why do you think the Apostle Paul, by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, has got to be so specific? Because he knew there was going to come a time in 21st American America, 21st century America, that, he, that Jezebels need to be kind of corralled in to say, no, 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 that's not what the Bible says. The Bible says, subject to your own husband. There's, submit to your own husband. The Bible says you need to subject. You need to get in line with this. You need to get in line with that. You need to submit yourself to this. You need to submit yourself to your own husband. Not everybody else. Not what you want to do. You don't run the roost. You submit to your own husband. <laughs> now, we know the spirit of Jezebel has been around for ever since, what we would say, the beginning of time because it's a demon. But with that, this same demon likes to go around, and that's the reason you have so many Karens, especially in today's time, is because they don't know how to submit to their own husband, so they rule the roost. They put the pants on in their family. They run everything, and then they, because they have outrun everybody in their home because they're like Hitler in their own home, now they take it outside of their home, and they expect everybody to bow to them and act like they're Hitler too. That's how you get a Karen. It's a demon. It's not just a personality where that's how God made me. No, that's how the devil made you. So either line up with the word of God or keep going and we'll see. Because you remember how Hitler turned out. His future didn't look so bright when he got surrounded by the allies in World War II. <laughs> and that's what the word of God is going to trap you in corner. You're not going to submit or you're going to pierce yourself through. <laughs> uh, amen. This is already being a little more interesting than I thought it would be. Colossians 3.18, wives, submit yourselves to your own husbands as it is fit in the Lord. Again, submit yourselves to your own husbands. Now, with lessons like this, and I find myself, you know, as I said, this is a little more, this is a little different teaching than when I thought it would come out. I don't mean that as a slight to anybody here. I mean that as, especially when you teach things like this in this day and age, we're, we're more than just speaking to the people that's present. We're speaking to the spirits that are in our region, the spirits that are of the world that we must combat. And when you, uh, when you present the truth of the Word of God, you're going to have that kind of conflict. You're going to have that, that representation of the enemy forces in your face because they don't want you speaking the truth because when you speak the truth, you may set somebody free. Amen. Amen. Because if you want a biblical marriage, a biblical marriage is the only one that's going to bring peace to your home, peace to your marriage, peace to your lives, peace to your hearts, peace to your minds. Because when you don't do it biblically, you have so much chaos, confusion, you have so many things that's going wrong. That's when people get in the mind of divorces, when people get in mind of this, people get in mind of that because they're giving in to so many other things and they've given ear to all these different voices and so we must bring it back biblically to hone in on what does the Word say. Let's keep it biblical because that's what brings peace. That's what brings victory in our, in our marriage and our home. Amen. These verses display there is an honor and submission that the wife is required to have for her husband. It's not suggested, it's required. I'm going to say that again. It's not suggested, it's required by the Word of God. Not my opinion, the Word of God. Within the home, no one outranks the husband, even God. <gasps> How dare you say that, Pastor? It's truth. Nobody outranks the husband in the home. But it is proper for the husband to submit to God. Because God's not going to force anybody to do anything. 
If, if he's not going to force Adam to say, all right, Adam, Eve messed up. You need to go, you need to go get on to her. You need to go do this. You need, to go, you need to get your house in order. And I'm making you. I'm making you, man. You're, my, you're the first one I created. I'm making you. You go get after her and you go do this. He didn't do that. What did he do? He, he, there was a different punishment. He said, all right, because Adam, you didn't disciple her like the way that she should have been discipled. And because she listened and was deceived by the, by the serpent, this, all three of them got punished in some shape, form, or fashion. The serpent had, was put on his belly, and the woman, the child of the woman, would, 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 be, would bruise him with, her, with his heel. Then you have the pain of childbirth with the woman, and then you have the man who would have to work and the ground wouldn't produce as much fruit and wouldn't produce as much for him as it used to. They were all three punished. But who was the head of all of that? Adam. Adam was the one that was put in charge. But because he chose not to disciple his wife and say, hey, if, that's, if any of these animals start speaking to you and trying to deceive you, tell them to shut up. Because we are to have dominion over the animals. We're to have dominion over this entire earth. Because God had already established that with Adam. But yet he didn't tell Eve that. Because of what's the first thing she does is she starts listening to this serpent. And she didn't find it ironic that it was talking to her. But she chose to listen to him. She obviously knew what God had said. So Adam obviously told her, All right, we don't partake of that tree. Because she knew to an extent of what God said. But the, but the serpent, would say the devil, twisted and perverted the word because she wasn't discipled well to understand, no, we don't twist what God said, we stay true to what God said, then she was able to be deceived, and she brought it back to Adam. Adam knowing what God had said, because God's the one that spoke it to him, he says, oh, okay, well, she's done it, I guess I would partake of it, and they all get judged for it. Anyway, no, when, within the home, no one outranks the husband, not even God. This comes at a price, at the price of the husband carrying the weight of the household's future on his shoulders. So good or bad, it's going to be on his shoulders. If the husband is wrong, the wife can assist in bringing the Bible and wisdom to her husband, but the ultimate decision is in the husband's hands. If he chooses to remain wrong, especially when he knows he's wrong, even that then the ju- that judgment is upon him as destruction comes to his household. If the husband is wrong yet allows himself to be subjected to his wife's advice as his helpmeet, to make the proper correction, then the house benefits from that subjection to a better path. See, that we are already seeing how the husband subjects to the wife and allows her to be the helpmeet that God has designed her to be. But that requires her to be submitted to the husband and say, you know, I'll, I'll do what you say, but I think this is, maybe you should consider this. You can, should consider that. You should think about this. Because what if, let, let's say if, now we know that this is kind of, just a picture being painted here. What if the serpent went to Adam? Now, what if, we'll say, and you, we shouldn't really get into what ifs, but I'm just trying to help us understand this. What if Adam discipled Eve the way he should have, told her everything verbatim of what God told him, then the serpent comes to Adam and b- begins to try to deceive him, the proper helpmeet in Eve would have went to Adam and said, I wouldn't listen to that little snake. I wouldn't listen to him. Remember what God told you and you told me you discipled me and this is what God had said. So don't be listening to that little guy. He's going to get us in trouble. I think you should do this. But then she would have to leave the decision to be for him. But we know that the the serpent went through the one that was discipled through a man and not directly spoken to God. That's another reason for us to be weary of when people begin to speak things over us or to us Because sometimes if God can't get to us as Adam, he'll get to one of our friends as Eve to speak that over into us or allow that to be in their life and they bring it to us and present it. And we trust them because of our friendship or relationship, whatever that situation may be. But we trust them and so we partake too. So we've got to be mindful of these things because the enemy wants to steal, kill, and destroy. That's not just the devil himself. That's any enemy that's in your life. Amen. So if the husband is right and the household is submitted to his authority, if the husband is right and, so there's two things, and the household is submitted to his authority, submitted, 
submitted, not subjected, submitted to his authority, the entirety of the household reaps the benefits of that submission to God. If he's right, if he, let's say if he's wrong and, he's, and he subjects himself to his wife and then he makes the right decision, well, the whole household benefits from that right decision. If he's wrong, then the whole household faces the judgment for his wrong decision. Even if they do or do not correct him and he chooses to go on his own route, they still will fall under that judgment because he's the head. So, but if he's right, and he's, whether he received the help from his helpmate or not, and he's right, then everybody reaps that benefit from that submission to God. This reflects the importance of submission and subjection. If a wife, ha- if a wife has a reputation for su- not, not submitting to her husband, he may have a hard time allowing himself to be subject to her advice. <laughs> If she's loudmouth Karen all the time, he may have a hard time listening to her because he's already, t- he's already trained himself to tune her out. Well, she's just going to fuss at me anyway. I might as well just turn off. But yet, the one, we'll say the one time that she is going to give sound advice, he's not listening because he thinks she's just fussing at him. So he's already tuned out. He's already got ESPN on. He's already got whatever. He's already just zoned out because he's so used to her. Mur, 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 and he's not listening to anything she's got to say. So that shows that the reputation must be of what we're about to see. If her reputation is one of submission, her husband should be willing to use this wonderful resource God has given him to see a different perspective at times that he may not be able to see. But that's if she has the reputation of being submitted. Now we get it as, as you know, husband and wife, whether, if you're already married, you've experienced this. If, you, if you're not married yet, but you're you know, going to be in the near future, then you'll get used to this. But sometimes you vent. We get that. You just have moments where you're just venting. I'm frustrated about this. I'm frustrated about that. But that doesn't mean we attack one another. That doesn't really necessarily qualify as being a, a Jezebel or a Karen. That's just venting about a situation. We get that. Because part of our human nature is we're almost like tea kettles. You put so much pressure that builds up on the inside, that steam's got to come out some, at some point or another. And it's either going to be healthy or unhealthy. Now, for it to scream and whistle, that's unhealthy. But for it to, to let off a little pressure at a time, that's the healthy version. To let off a little bit at a time so it doesn't build up and blow. <laughs> You've got to at least a, a, release a little bit at a time. But that, even that has to be done accurately so that way it doesn't come across the husband as a jerk or the wife as a Karen, it's got to come off properly with your spouse so that way you don't ruin your reputation with them. Because really, at the end of the day, you're going to spend the rest of your life with this person. That's the way God designed it to be. And so you don't want to wreck your, your whole covenant and your relationship with your spouse over one circumstance, over something that's going on. You don't want to wreck the entirety of the rest of your marriage and the rest of your covenant over something silly especially. Because in the grand scheme of things, how many arguments have we had? Well, let's say arguments. How many disagreements or how many words have we said, not just including marriages but with anybody, that really, when you think back about it, it's like, that didn't even amount to a hill of beans. But yet, at the moment, I was so emotional, I was so upset that we both kind of got heated and we both said things we didn't mean and we both said things we regret. We had to make up for it later. Hopefully that's the case. And we both made up and now we still have fellowship. But still, it's, our relationship is different because we both got heated and we both just exploded instead of letting off a little steam and being able to handle it properly. That happens a lot in marriages. Where you just you build up the teapot and then all of a sudden it begins to whistle and everything is just like the kettle starts shaking and it's just going crazy. Why? Because there's been so much pressure built up that hasn't been taken care of. And a healthy relationship will allow you to talk and to work things out and to get those things smoothed out before it gets to that point. It's, it's sad that many marriages will only go to counseling when somebody mentions divorce or when something gets so bad that it's about to end. That's the only time that they finally say, hey, I think we need to go to counseling. But by then, the other person is just like, oh, I don't want to. I'm, I, I, I've already checked out because you've already bitten me so many times. I'm done. And it's like you, you kind of see both sides of that. One's wanting help and to keep it. The other one's been bitten so many times. It's like I can't trust you because every time I do, every time I go to... to to pet on you or love on you, you bite me. And after so many years of that, I'm done. 
And it's like, that doesn't make it right, but you can see that point of view. When, when everything's handled biblically, the Word tells us not to let the sun go down on our wrath, not to let the sun go down on our anger. So that means we should handle things before the sun even goes down because you're not promised tomorrow. How many people have lost a loved one when they wish they would have dealt with whatever it was between them for years or for however long it was, maybe even the night before. I wish I would have said this. I wish I would have said this. I wish I would have just said forgive me. I wish I would have said I'm sorry. I wish I would have, I wish I would have. And then how many times have people are going to have to now face the rest of their life because they didn't make it right before they went to bed with somebody else? That, now that applies more than just marriage, but especially in a marriage. <laughs> So we've got to see this in the bigger picture. That's the reason that so many verses in the Bible tell us how to handle and how to walk with people. Even in the Ten Commandments, you have four that deals with how to walk with God and six that how to, deal with how to walk with people. So even God says it's harder to walk with man than it is God. I give you more commandments to walk with a man than to walk with me. Something to think about. But submission is vital to be a proper helpmeet. Submission is vital to be a proper helpmeet. So the husband subjects to the wife. So Genesis 2.18 says, And the Lord God said, It is not good that the man should be alone. I will make a helpmeet for him. So the whole point of a helpmeet is to receive help. <laughs> and how can you do that if you just overlook her all the time? You subject yourself. Say, so, honey, what do you think? Amen. Genesis 2.20 and Adam gave names to all cattle and to the fowl of the air and to the every beast of the field. But for Adam there was not found an help meet for him. 1 Corinthians 11, 8 and 9 says, For the man didn't come from woman, but the first woman came from man, and the man was not made for woman, but woman was made for man. Oh, that just slapped a bunch of feminists in the face. <laughs> 1 Corinthians 11, 11 and 12 says, But among the Lord's people, woman... Women, we would say, are not independent of men, and men are not independent of women. For although the first woman came from man, every other woman was, or every other man was born from a woman, and everything comes from God. So we can see that in these verses, they're made for each other, but the woman was especially made for the man. Why? Because God knows, I can't trust that guy by himself. He's not going to wash his clothes. He's not going to take, he can't have kids. He can't do this. He can't do that. He needs a woman. He needs some help. Amen. Okay, well, at least I need help. I'll admit it, I need help. Amen. <laughs> but, but it's one of those things where God said, God looked and he had all the animals and they had, a, a, they had we'll say, a mate to go with. And he looks at Adam and Adam's all by himself. And he says, that's not good. I've got to make somebody for him. And so he makes woman out of him and he makes Eve out of his rib to walk beside him, not out of the heel, not out of the head. He, he makes her from his rib to walk beside him, to be that helpmeet. Now, I like, I, I compare it to it this way. Like for Miss Tiffany and I, you know, us, you know, her being my help meet and helping me do, you know, everything that we do, everything we put our hand to, which is a lot, by the way. But it's one of those things to where she is, many people say, well, that's my right hand person. I would call Miss Tiffany my left hand person, not because she's not dominant in my life and is, does a lot for me, but because in the military, when, you, when someone outranks you, you walk on their left side. Why is that? Because when you walk on their left side, that was the side that was known for weakness. That was the side that was known where if they're attacked, they're on their weaker side so they can protect the one they're helping. They can protect their captain. They can protect their leader. They can protect so they can still lead. And so with that, I, that's the reason I think of Miss Tiffany as my left-hand woman is because she's there because she does so much for me and helps me, but she's there also protecting me and helping me from other things, helping me, praying for me, taking care of me from so many attacks of the enemy, taking care of me you know, in our own home and in, our, in, in so many things that we put our hand to. She's there helping me, and that's what a help meet is designed for, is to be on that weaker side of the man to help him in his time of need. Because especially when you go back to the days of sword fighting, many people were right hand dominant, and so they would fight with their right hand, so that would leave their left side open. And that was the reason they needed somebody on their left side to guard them and walk with them and take, take care of them. 
So as displayed from the above verses, although man, as a husband, has the highest rank within the home, he needs the help of his wife to be balanced. He needs the help of his wife to be balanced. This requires subjection on the husband's part to allow his wife to give input or wisdom that will assist him in making the final decision. If the husband does not allow his wife to be the helpmeet God designed for, him, for her to be, then he runs the risk of being unbalanced and a dictator within his home. <laughs> He's either a dictator like a Hitler or he becomes an Ahab. Because he's learned, I can't, I can't subject to her. She's just going to run over me anyway, so I just let her take control. So he just becomes the weakling. But the help me is supposed to keep the, the man balanced. To not be such a dictator and Hitler, but to also not put him under her foot, but they work together. God made Eve for Adam and to not be alone and to assist him. In some areas, the husband submits to his wife in the role that he ordains her, or we would say gives her the authority to fulfill. Now, as we're about to see from some of these verses, the wife is supposed to be the governess of the home. And so when he gives her that authority, then if she puts a system in place of that house, then he must submit to her authority as the governess of the house. So how can that be? Although he's the head. But yes, if it's her process and it's under her authority that he has given her and ordained for her to have, he must submit to it. <laughs> That's like, well, we'll just use this. Let's say if, if there is a process for laundry, then if the husband says, all right, you know, wife, because we're not just going to use names, well, wife, I need you to oversee this. I need you to oversee this. Come up with a process to help us deal with this laundry. We've got 20 kids. We've got you and I. Now, you know we're pulling numbers now. So we just, we got 20 kids, we got you and I, so we got to figure out a laundry situation. We got to figure out a laundry process, a system for this. She says, okay. So he's given her the authority. I'm putting you in charge of this. So her as the governess of the home, she says, all right, kid one through five is going to do laundry on this day. Kid five through 10 is going to do laundry on this day, or six through 10. Kid, whatever, 11 through 14 is going to do it on this day and everybody else and you and I will do it on this day and that day and this day. We've got seven days to spread it out, so that's what we'll do. So she comes up with a system. And all of a sudden, the husband says, well, I don't want to do my laundry that day. I want to do my laundry on this day. Now, if he bucks up and says, well, I'm the head of this house, I'll do what I want to. He is no longer submitting to that authority. He has now become the one that's out of line. Y'all look at me like a calf at a new gate. <laughs> he's the one that's out of line. Why? Because he has given her that authority and he's given her that, that, we'll say, that dominion in that area, in that process, so he must submit to the process because of that, because of that way of thinking, because of that authority. Now, if he was to say, well, honey, you know, well, give us some time, and if he says, well, honey, I think that maybe if we tweaked it this way or if we tweaked it that way, then... He can subject that to her, and she can either run with it or not. But if something doesn't change, if it doesn't work, then he can, or we'll say as the, as the head of the household, say, honey, I, we, we need to change this. We've been trying this for a couple months now. It's not working. We've made a few changes. That's not working. So I, as the husband, we need, we need to make another change. We need to figure out this. That's the proper way that he would absurd, uh, uh, usurp his authority over her as that authority. Uh, authority in that process or system. But we can see how much there is this subjection and submission that goes hand in hand with both spouses. So we, but we, if we don't do this biblically, we get it out of line and everything becomes unbalanced. And now you're bringing, you're bringing chaos, confusion, and so many things, not just to the marriage, you're bringing to the whole home. And so we've got to keep everything in balance. Amen. Amen. 1 Timothy 5.14 says, Therefore I want younger women to marry, have children, manage their households. There's your verse, one of the verses for being a governess of the home. Manage their households. Who's he talking to? The younger women. To marry, to have children, manage their households, and give the adversary no opportunity to accuse us. That means not only is the husband in charge of not giving any room for the enemy, but the wife is. There's, there's quite a few times, uh, you know, if, if, let's say that most of us are home 
during the week, and I'm working downstairs and doing my stuff, and all of a sudden I hear a couple of them, a couple of the boys arguing, and before I can even say anything or get up, Miss Tiffany's doing with it. Why? Because she's not, she said, boys, no, we're done. Because y'all are breeding strife, y'all are breeding this, y'all are breeding that. You're not doing this anymore. You're bringing it into our home, and that's not what we want. That's not the way we run our house. It's before I can even get up or say anything, she's doing with it. Why? Because that's part of her role as a godly wife, is to be able to take care of that, give no room, no opportunity for the enemy. Now, we know that that just is just one example of many that we could come up with, but that's you know, an example that we should be seeing in our homes. Amen. Titus 2, 4, and 5 says, So that they may encourage the younger women to tenderly love their husbands and their children, to be sensible, pure, makers of a home. There's another verse for governors of the home. Where God is honored, good-natured, being subject to their own husbands. Now, if you study this word, now notice this is the amplified. If you study that word subject there, you'll find the root word submission. King James likes to go back and forth. So sometimes you've got to dig what is the proper root of this word in its original language. Because as we even said in our definitions, they're so close, sometimes people will use them as synonyms, but really there are, there are differences in those. Being subject to their own husbands so that the word of God will not be dishonored. So you mean to tell me that the role of a wife is not just to look pretty and have the home pretty? No, no, no. The, one of the, the key factors of a wife, a good help meet, is so that the word of God will not be dishonored in the home. Amen. Now, that looks like many different things. There's so much to unpack there. And we'll, as we said, we'll have a whole other lesson on the role of a wife. But there's so much there that the word of God will not be dishonored. But again, it's not solely on her either. It's also on the husband. Because at the end of the day, he's the one that's got to make the final decisions. And if the house is in good standing, it's, it's, we'll say it's on him and the family for being obedient and submission to God, submitted to God. If the house fails, it's solely on him because he didn't work out any kinks or any issues in within his own home to bring it into submission unto God. Husbands should allow their wives to be the governess of the home to oversee operations of the family. With this process, a husband should submit to the systems his wife has in place to keep the home in order, but he would have the ultimate authority to overrule that system if he needed to change it to fit the heavenly vision. Although he has authority to change those systems, he should not abuse that authority because he must submit to a plan that he doesn't like. (laughs) Uh, I'll tell off of myself. Miss Tiffany will... On our refrigerator, she has this board, and she'll list, she'll write out like the detail of like what we're having for dinner each night. And sometimes she'll say, "Well, we're going to have this on that night," and I'm like, uh, "Okay." It's like I may kind of I may kind of grumble for a moment, but I'm like, "She's the governor of this house. She's the governess of this house. She's the one that fixes the food, so I'm submitting." <laughs> now, every once in a while, she'll look, she'll catch me when I do that, and she'll say. Oh, you don't want that? Well, what do you want? All right. I don't know. That sounds good. Because I'm, because I'm like, really, it doesn't matter. But my, my, my appetite will probably change before we even get to that day. And I'll probably appreciate that meal. But just at the moment, I'm feeling like chicken nuggets and fries, and she's thinking like beans and greens. And I'm thinking, yeah, we'll, we'll, wait, we'll wait till that day gets there, and then we'll see how we feel. Amen. <laughs> but no, we shouldn't override a system just because we don't want to line up. Because if that was the case, oh, wait a minute, that's what people do now anyway. Because when you don't like what, what the word that goes forth and preached anyway, you don't submit to it. When you don't like what the church is doing, you don't submit to it. When you do, there's so many things in life that you just, yeah, I don't feel like doing that. You just give up and quit or you just, oh, I'm going to do what I want to. Or I'm, I'm going to go over here to this church. I'm going to go do that church. I'm going to go whatever. And you just give up. That's what people's mentality is now. Because <laughs> so, you've got to have endurance. You got to have endurance. That's the, reason so, that's the reason there's such a high divorce rate, even among Christians that look like the world. Why? Because they treat their marriage just like the world does. They don't do it biblically. They don't hold the standard and say, what does God's word say? This is the reason that courtship is so important, is to make sure you're marrying the right person and not just anything that will open its legs to you or anybody that will kiss you on the first date. You got to find the right person because it's meant for life. 
It's not meant for, well, we'll try it out for a little while and, you know, we'll see how it goes. <laughs> That's not the way this is supposed to operate. The way it's supposed to operate is you find who God has for you to help you do what God has planned and purposed in your life. Amen. And you do biblically. Amen. God still helps a husband today have this wonderful, beautiful helpmate known as a wife within his life. That's getting harder and harder to find. And I would also say on the flip side, it's getting harder and harder to find men who are actually chasing after God for a woman to submit to. <laughs> Doesn't mean they're all gone. It's just harder and harder to find. That's the reason we've got to believe in the power of prayer and faith. Amen. It is the responsibility of each spouse to know when to submit and when to subject to know one another. Reminds me of Kenny Rogers. Know when to hold them, know when to fold them. No one to walk away, no one to run, because she's getting out the frying pan. Come here, honey, we've got to have a little talk. No, no, no. <laughs> that's, that's just, it's just meant for a little bit of humor. We don't do that, because that's not right. It's not the way we react. Remember, you can be angry, but sin not. Amen. Uh, yep. It's responsibility of each spouse to know when to submit and when to subject to one another. Amen. Do it biblically. Submission to spiritual leaders. Now, I added this because, well, I added this originally in our, when we first wrote this, because there were some times people were wanting pastors to get in the middle of their marriage, and that's not biblically accurate. As we've already said, the husband within the home has the highest ranking, uh, we'll say status or authority, within the home. So as previously mentioned, within the home, no one outranks the husband, even spiritual leaders, including the local pastor. Now, we get it. You know, if, if a wife or a husband is coming to the pastor and say, Pastor, I need some advice, I need some help, I need some counsel, the pastor can give the word, and that's fine and good. We get that. That's just receiving help. But dragging him into a situation, Pastor, I need you to talk to my wife. Pastor, I need you to talk to my husband. I need you to straighten them out. I need you to straighten this person out. I need you to come over here. And... No, 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 no. You can't do that. The pastor is meant to give you the word for you to do it. To give you counsel of what the Word says, to give you guidance of what the Word says, maybe you know some wisdom on how to handle a situation because they've either been there before or witnessed another couple that's been through something similar, but it's only counsel. It's not to intervene and not to get in the middle of. It's just for counsel. So even God does not make the husband submit to him, but allows the husband to make the final decision whether right or wrong. It would behoove the husband to submit to God. It would behoove the husband to submit to God. Although the entire family should be submitted to the local pastor within the church, the family must submit to the husband, the father, within the home. Now, I dare say many, many conversations that my pastor and I have had, you know, I'll ask, I'll ask him from time to time, Pastor, do you see anything in myself or my family that needs to be taken care of? And he's told me, he says, uh, you might work on this, but I can work on that. He said, you know, and I'll say, was there anything, you know, my wife or my boys need to tweak or whatever? He said, no, nah. he said, I know that you'll take care of it if, when you see it pop up. Yes, sir. That's the biblical way it should be. Is because when things pop up, it's not meant for the pastor to intervene. Now, he may could say, hey, you may want to watch this or may keep an eye on this or keep an eye on that relationship or watch because maybe this person's kind of leaning this way. I can see it by the Spirit. However, but it's not meant for the pastor to get hands-on involved and up in your business in your home. So we can see that. But I appreciate that about my pastor is he also has the faith in me to say, hey, if there's something going on that you'll call it out and you'll take care of it. Yes, sir. So, I mean, that's, our home is our responsibility. We can receive all the counsel, what the Word says, absolutely. No harm, no foul in that. That's what, what the local church and the local leadership is for, as far as spiritually, is to give you that counsel, help you see the Word, maybe understand parts of the Word that maybe you're not, that you haven't seen before, or maybe not saw it in a view like that before to help us. But it's meant for counsel, not to help dictate what your family does. So although the entire family, again, should be submitted to the local pastor within the church. The family must submit to the husband, the father within the home. 1 Peter 5.5 5. Likewise, ye younger, submit yourselves to the elder. Yea, all of you be subject one to another. Notice this local house of God subject one to another. And be clothed with humility. For God resisted the proud and giveth grace to the humble. So that means 
you, the younger submit themselves to the elder. Now remember, he's talking to Christians. It's not just a house. He's talking to the local. He's talking to Christians everywhere. Be subject to one another. That means that you submit in the proper authority, but at times you su- you subject yourself to what does others say. What's some other counsel that I can receive? Not I'm I'm polling people to see what you know if there's anybody else that believes like I do that I want to do this and everybody's telling me no, then I'm gonna finally find somebody who can tell me yes. That's not what he's talking about. He says you subject yourself to others to say, okay, what what's your counsel in this? What's your counsel in this? And you go to spiritual leaders that you trust that can help bring wisdom and what the actual word says, not opinions. It says, clothe the humility, for God resists the proud and gives grace to the humble. For, see, Romans 13, 1 and 2 says, Let every soul be subject unto the higher powers, for there is no power but of God, the powers that are ordained of God, the powers that be are ordained of God. Whosoever therefore resisteth the power, resisteth the ordinance of God. And they that resist shall receive to themselves damnation. Let's read this verse again. Let every soul be subject to the higher powers. That's not just talking about civil authority. That's talking about spiritual authority as well. It's talking about every authority that God has established. For there is no power but of God. The powers that be are ordained of God. You mean that God put Joe Biden as president? No. (laughs) He set the office as president to have the authority that it has. God sets offices. That's like for here, God established a pastor long before I ever got here. But he maneuvers, when, when, you know, he maneuvers people to be in leadership at the proper time if people will submit to what he says. Now, we can also say when you're dealing with elections and things, you're also dealing with the will of people, and God will not override the will of people. You got to keep that in mind. But we can pray favor. We can pray people begin to see that to change things in regard to that as well. But whosoever therefore resisted the power, resisted the ordinance of God, and they that resist, and they that they that resist shall receive to themselves damnation. So when you resist the power that's supposed to be in your life, we'll say the leader that's in your life, then you are bringing to yourself damnation. Romans thirteen four through seven, for he is a minister of God to thee for good. That's the outline. It's the minister is supposed to be for your good. Now, this is also talking about spiritual and civil authorities. But if thou do that which is evil, be afraid. For he beareth not the sword in vain, for he is the minister of God, a revenger to execute wrath upon him that doeth evil. Wherefore, ye must needs be subject, not only for wrath, but also for conscience' sake. For this cause pay ye tribute also, for they are God's ministers attending continually upon this very thing. Render therefore to all their dues, tribute to whom tribute is due, custom to whom custom, fear to whom fear, honor to, to whom honor. The pastor as well as other spiritual leaders are established to, to assist every member of the family within the church, but within the home there is a different system of authority that establishes that unit. That's like for me, and some of you may remember when Miss Tiffany was ministering it in grafted word when I was in basic training and there was something going on with Elijah where he was in the hospital and it was a very serious thing that he was put in there for a disease that pastor Chris actually called and was able to get a hold of me and I was able to give him verbal permission to step in that gap make up that hedge for my family he didn't just say well you know what I'm there for him they've seen me a few times I'm just gonna go and do my own thing that's not what he did He made sure that the authority, that the permission and the ordination for me to pass that on as the husband, to pass that on to the pastor, to step into that gap and that role was there. And that's what I believe made the difference. So that when he and some of the elders laid their hands on on Elijah, that he received that healing because the the authority and the power had been transferred, not, not by me laying hands on him, but by me verbally giving him permission as a spiritual leader of my home to pass it on to him to stand in the gap at that time. So the husband and wife are taught by the pastor to grow in the things of God. Of course, Ephesians 4, 11 through 12. But the husband is charged with the responsibility of leading biblically and correctly. The wife and children within the, within the home are the husband or slash father's disciples. 
The fruit and character produced within those individuals are a reflection of the husband and father. Now, that doesn't mean that, you know, any knucklehead can get up, show their tail, kind of be a wild hair, but that, that means that you got to start pruning things and say, no, we're not going to act like that. Nope, we're not doing that. Nope, you line up, I'm, and you start pruning stuff. You start peeling things back. You start dealing with things. So, that, so we get that because it's just like us as even adults. Sometimes we get a wild hair. We do something goofy and stupid. doesn't mean that we're a bad, a bad tree. It just means, hey, we've we done something stupid, and God had to prune us. And so it's, it's the same way with the family. Even, but overall, the overall fruit of the household is what you judge, is what you can see. The husband should reflect his pastor. Now, here's to be specific on that. The doctrine of message is not the person of the pastor. That's like, I love my pastor. I love his doctrine. I don't like Toyotas. Praise God. <laughs> That's a joke. It's a joke he and I have running. And but anyway... But it's, that's part of it, though. We, re, we reflect our pastor, but it's not the person exactly what he likes. It's the Word of God coming forth because of that gift of Jesus Christ. So the husband should re- reflect his pastor, the Word of God, and most importantly, Jesus Christ is his example. Hebrews thirteen seventeen, Obey them to have the rule over you and submit yourselves, for they watch for your souls as they that must give, and as they that must give account that they may do it with joy and not with grief, for that is not as unprofitable for you. The family should submit to the pastor together to be of one mind and one accord with God's plan for their lives. It is not biblical to go to two different churches. It's not biblical. We've had that in some of our family that they've asked mine and Miss Tiffany's opinion, and we're like, it's not biblical. You, don't, you shouldn't be going to two different churches. You're supposed to be going to the same church because you're supposed to be united in that vision, united in what God has planned for you. Amen. Within the home, the husband is the final authority that can choose to submit to the word of God, the local pastor, or the will of God, or choose not to submit, creating issues for his household due to disobedience. Husbands, the success of your family depends on your walk with God and your willingness to submit to him. Now, that does not mean that they get to ride in on your coattails. That means how you lead is what they will pick up on and how they will receive from God. Your walk and your willingness to submit to God, it it paints the picture for them to emulate or imitate. This is a critical aspect of being a husband that many men do not even consider. (laughs) So don't be talking about being a husband or a father unless you've counted the cost unless you as the bible says you've counted the wages of war you've counted not, not that marriage is war but you've counted all the cost i got to give this up i got to i got to straighten this out i got to get this in line i got to get that in line because as we've said not my pastor has said many times a quarter or a whole a half a person and a half a person does not equal a whole person it equals a quarter of a person so when you haven't dealt with things and you're trying to get things in line, you've got to submit things to God and get yourself in order because how are you going to lead anybody else if you yourself haven't fully submitted unto God? Although husbands are to have the, the final and highest authority within the home, this does not permit them to be a dictator or jerk to the rest of the family members. This region is known for that. As the leader, he gives an example of what right looks like. I'll say that ten times fast. As a leader, he gives an example of what right looks like. I just want to see if I could say it again. <laughs> if the husband fulfills his role correctly, he gives his son he gives his sons an example of how to treat their wife, their future wife, his daughters an example of what to look for in a future husband, and protection, provision, and pleasure to his wife. If the wife fulfills her role correctly, she gives her sons an example of what to look for in a future wife. Her daughter's an example of how to treat their future husbands and respect, help, and pleasure to her husband. Notice both of them end in pleasure. And that just not, it's not, not just sexually. Amen. There are many ideas of pleasure, whether it's a back rub, whether it's just taking care of something, whether it's doing something in the home. There's so much more to that that carnal people will not, they will not grasp at. So we must see it in the bigger picture. May we as husbands and wives be in a proper submission as well as subjection to one another to honor God within our lives and our marriages. Amen.